travel about 5,000 miles away back to Montreal with you and a bit back in time. I was uh, in a park in Montreal in 2012, February 2012. Any one of you who have been anywhere near Montreal in February, you'll know that the average temperature is usually minus 15, minus 20, and it's very snowy, very icy. And I was in a park, and I looked up at the bright blue sky, because the sky is really beautiful in February. It was very sunny, and something caught my attention. It was a, an airplane, about one meter in wingspan. And what was amazing about this airplane is that it was flying like the airplanes I had seen at air shows. I was an aerospace executive for many years. And as I see this airplane defy the laws of gravity and in, in, in the laws of science, usually only expert test pilots can do, I can't help but walk up to the gentleman that's flying this plane. And I, and I meet a, a cool guy. His name is Amir. I won't tell you which country he was born in, but he's now Canadian. And um, he's a second year mechanical engineering student at the time. So I start talking to him, and I'm looking at this plane, and I say, Amir, where did you get this? And he says, well, I designed it, and I built it. You know, I Googled it. I go, you Googled it. Internet, OK, got you. So I'm going, wow, he's pretty powerful, this young man. And then I, I see in the front of the plane, there's a little camera, the type of camera you see on a computer usually. And I go, what's the camera for, Amir? And he says, oh, this is cool. You see, I'm pilot in command. I, I sit in the plane. And he, and he shows me this helmet. And inside the helmet, he goes, look at my display. He's got a helmet-mounted display. At that point, I'm, I'm going, wow, wow. This is something that a couple of years ago would have taken, a couple of years before 2012 anyways, would have taken a corporation, a few engineers, and probably lots of money to put together. And talking about lots of money, I said, Amir, how much does this cost? And Amir says, oh, $850. I go, OK. You mean for everything? He goes, yeah, I, I got the helmet on internet. I go, all right. At that point, I'm, I'm like sitting on the sidewalk. I'm going, you mean I've been in aerospace all this time? I thought it took corporations to do this? And this young 21-year-old with a credit card, with internet, Googles it, and somehow he plays in the park with it? That, that was like, I'm thinking, I missed something. There's like a chapter in life that somehow went right by me. And then now I'm going to step back a little further in time. In, uh, it must have been November 2011, a university that I graduated from, Concordia, the dean from Concordia comes to see me and he says, uh, the dean of engineering comes and sees me and he says, Xavier, I'd like your help if you could set up an innovation center. See, at that point, I'm, I'm president of my company. I'm credited for having brought innovation across our industry. We've delivered products across the world. So I'm thinking, why does this guy want to do innovation? I mean, innovation, he wants me to create what he calls an innovation zone? I'm thinking, this is what industry does. But I'm thinking, maybe we'll set up an innovation training zone or something. I never got training as an entrepreneur, so I thought maybe we could try this. So, so we got going, but I only got going when I saw Amir. I said, OK, I got to open my eyes, open my ears. There's things to discover. And then started this journey. Soon after, we opened the doors to, to what's known today as District 3. The first story that I want to share with you on this journey is a story with, uh, before I share the story, one thing I must make clear, innovation and research is not the same thing, right? We all know that today. Um, research generates tons of great knowledge. And, and there's revolutions happening right now across the world in six research initiatives that are shared across the planet that are as powerful as the digital revolution has been for the last 50 years. Just so that we're clear, innovators take that knowledge and bring it to society by creating solutions, products and services. They, they do what we call meet the unmet needs. Now, when, let's go back to the story of, of, that I wanted to share with you. The first one is Hyacinth Bio, a startup that, that came out of uh, a research center at Concordia called Genome, specializes in synthetic biology, one of those exponential technologies. Synthetic biology, I thought, was something very complicated. Till I met Zach. 
Zach is the CEO of this startup, Hyacinth. Zach and his team over coffee explained to me that with a bit of spare time and a few Petri dishes and a few hundred dollars, they had managed to engineer what we know as THC or cannabinoids, the heart of uh, marijuana or what they make hashish with. But that's not the treasure I found. I had discovered that a couple of decades before. <laughs> the, the, the treasure I found here was these young people in which had been seeded this knowledge. Their mind was full with a very unique knowledge. And with that, they were able to have ideas with a potential huge impact in our society. Think about it, they took that engineered molecule, they mixed it with a process monks had invented a couple hundred years ago, and now for $10 a kilo, they produce stuff several tons at a time that is worth $10,000 a kilo. Whether you agree with the use of cannabinoids or not is really not important. What's important is it's going to have a massive impact on society whether some of us like it or not. And because you've seeded that knowledge in these minds, they can solve huge problems. The second thing I discovered as a treasure, or as a jewel in the treasure box of innovation zones, is, uh, is the fact that this young team, so five 20-something year old guys and girls, there's two women and three gentlemen, within six months they went from idea to prototyping to incorporating to being entrusted with a better part of a million dollars. I'm a business guy that comes from the, the mega speed business. These guys from, they're in hyperspace. They're, they're going at a speed I never thought was possible. They were entrusted with this money by, you know, young Montreal team, entrusted it by the, it, with this, all this money by uh, investors in Dublin, in Ireland. And you know how they got to them? Well, like Amir said, they Googled it. They got into a competition, a student competition known as a hackathon. There's hackathons on every subject right now on the planet. And... Uh, Venture capitalists and angel investors, so-called angel investors, they're actually seeking these people. They're looking for them. They're looking for what's going to be the next mega impact initiative. And they're looking for them with all this money to give them, all those means and resources, more than money actually and often, to achieve their vision. So two jewels we found. The young seated minds and what I like to think of as the startup economics of the 21st century. Now, second story on my journey, I run into uh, uh, a guy called Mazen, Mazen El Bawa. Mazen's the CEO of a company known as Hedoko today. Mazen has uh, this vision for wearable technologies, to use wearable technologies to become a game changer for the training of athletes. He wants to use wearable technologies I know you don't know this, probably most of you don't know, but you're gonna have cloth at your house soon, which has so many sensors in it, talking to your phone, telling the network everything that you feel. I know you've got lots of secrets, you don't want everyone to know what you feel, but it's gonna happen sooner or later for a lot of people. And he wants to use this technology to increase evidence-based training for athletes. But that's not the treasure either. The treasure that I discovered in the Mazen story is that when Mazen came to see me, he didn't have a place to put a prototype together. He was kind of stuck. He had a business model, he had an idea, had a vision, but didn't have a team. So I said, Maz, why don't you have a seat here at District 3? I said, sit down and let me go get a couple of people. So I walked to the other end of the room, I grabbed a couple of young minds I knew. I said, guys, meet Mazen, Mazen's gonna explain to you what, uh, what he wants to do. So I now fast forward to February 2015. Hedeko is a team of 19 people. They just were um, gold medalists in San Francisco in, the world innovation, well, in an event leading up to the World Innovation Forum, and they were finalists in Munich in February 2015. They went from an idea to being medalists in Olympics in a very short amount of time. And what I discovered in that story was that there's a win-win in it because these entrepreneurs Mazin, who came as a 10-year experienced professional in the world of entertainment technologies, he came with a vision, an idea, but he needed skills. These young minds had skills and they found an exciting project to work on. What else could they want but 
a place to use the skills they had learned in school, a place to start their career, their CV, so to speak, and work on an innovation project. I mean, what more excitement can a 20-something-year-old engineer or business or art student want? A chance to start. And uh, it was the win-win. That was the jewel. The win-win that exists amongst these people and these entrepreneurs. Last story. Um, it's a fun story for me because I was lucky to be actually a coach of this team um, with my co-founder, uh, Deborah Dyser Gale. We coached a team known as Skywell. Skywell last July won um, another tournament or competition in, uh, in Rotterdam. It's the Shell 360. Shell 360 is sponsored by Shell. And um, it's, it's actually quite an amazing competition. It's about improving the use of energy and resources. They were competing against 680 teams from some of the best engineering schools in the world. Charles, Alior, and Sammy are not engineers. They're uh, business, science, and arts from the business, science, and arts faculties. And that was their power. They were an interdisciplinary team. They were able to share with each other. They were able to make the others discover what they didn't know. They were able to do 2 plus 2 equals 6. And it seems that the millennia generation has an ability to build interdisciplinary teams, very temporal teams, focused on solving problems. They can very quickly develop a common vocabulary. They can adopt a common method and deliver. They can do it in a way that I don't see, well, my generation, gray hair people can do. They have, I don't know if it was Facebook, I don't know if it was, I don't really know what changed in their generation, but they can do it. They can do it in a very powerful way. So that was the fourth jewel. So four jewels we found in the treasure box. Um, the first one was the interdisciplinary team. The second is the uh, entrepreneur win-win combination with those teams. The third is the uh, 21st century startup economics, this ease of access to cash across the world. And the fourth is um, these seeded minds with this technology that most of us cannot imagine. But that is the ingredients that you need to do all this with. The how really, we got really lucky. And I'll explain to you why we got really lucky because it didn't make any sense. You see, I'm not here to, uh, to brag at all about what our teams did. Um, what, what we found astounding was when we looked at all these teams winning at these competitions, we, we didn't get it at the beginning. We were looking at this and going, what, what really happened? It was like saying we had opened up a gym two years ago, and within two years, you were getting athletes that are winning medals in top competitions. We're not that smart. We didn't, you know, what happened? So as we looked at it, we realized that we had been very, very, very lucky, very, very fortunate that many people had shared with us their experience, and we were able to construct a recipe. Well, we didn't really construct it. We fell upon a recipe. And the recipe goes like this. You take the four ingredients, and you don't need lots of it. You just need it in some quantity. No specific ratio, no specific uh, dosages. You just need to mix them. You need to add a few spices. I like to think of them as spices. Spices include a couple of serial entrepreneurs, you know, just to get them going. More importantly, the spices are methods. Methods that are available online for anyone. They're, they're called scrumming, um, lean startup, design thinking. You take all that, the spices, the ingredients, you put it in one big cooking pot. And, and not many little kitchens, not many little pots, one pot. You make sure that the pot is too small for the quantity that you have. You shove it all in. You make sure they're all upside down on top of each other. You keep shoveling. You close the pot, pressure cooker hopefully. You turn on the heat. And within a year, you will see happen things that you didn't think was possible, or at least I didn't believe was possible. Real innovation with real impact hitting the, the community around you. And it's really 
pretty simple. It's available to anyone who wants to do it. It's particularly low-hanging fruit in universities, but I believe any community can do it. Anybody, any community can unleash, open up the tr treasure box. It does require um, alignment from the community. And before I bring you to that conclusion, or, or my um, discovery as it was personal for me, I want to share a bit of a dream moment with you. Um, and this moment was constructed by a couple of uh, the young minds that I work with. They said, well, it's like, you know, this space, this innovation space, this innovation zone that, that we've got now, they said to me, it's like an international airport hub. It's, it's a hub where there's takeoffs and landings. People come in, come in and out. It's really uh, very disorderly in a way, but very organized at the same time. And uh, all of a sudden, lands the uh, Dr. Pasteur of tomorrow, not, not the old one, the, the young version. And his wife, they land, and they go to the coffee stand. And then a couple hours later, the um, famous Rumi, the, the young version, the one of tomorrow, shows up as well. And he meets Pasteur at the coffee machine. And miracle, they connect. They like each other. They start talking, they create something. And they forget about the takeoff part. They just sit there and start working on it. And then a couple more hours later, a couple of days later maybe, lands the young version of Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Doesn't really matter. And they connect. And then miracles start to happen. Things that you hadn't imagined, solutions to problems you thought were not solvable, simply because a bit like Amir when Amir did his plane, I would have said you can't do it, but Amir didn't know that you can't do it, right? And he proved it wrong. Amir can do it. And that was probably for me the biggest part of the tipping moment um, of this whole story is finally understanding that these minds have a medium, have an environment today. This whole international digital space, this worldwide digital space enables things together with this technology that we hadn't imagined. And it gave me hope. It gave me real fundamental hope that a lot of the problems that I was starting to think will never fix them, there's actually solutions just waiting to happen. And there's these young minds, if you let them free, if our community frees them up, because that's really all I had to learn to do, was let them be. They'll make it happen for you. The world will be miracles, that's all I can say. Thank you very much for your time.